Okay, so this unit is about chi-squared tests. Um, and before we jump into all the details, I wanted to give you a chance to sort of reason it out on your own. So let's start with a really simple example. Um, a cough syrup comes in three flavors, cherry, grape, and orange, and the company claims that 50% of its customers prefer cherry, 25% prefer grape, and 25% prefer orange. We randomly sampled 200 of the customers and asked their favorite flavor, um, and I have two different samples that you could get in this scenario. So two questions to think about before we move on. Um, first of all, if the company's claim were true, how many would you expect in each of these categories? So what would be the counts that you would expect in each of those categories? Okay, and then for these two samples, which of those would provide stronger evidence against the company's claim? So go ahead, pause the video right there for a second, see if you can reason this out, um, and then we'll connect it to more technical details. All right, so to fill in these boxes, um, if we sample 200 people and the company's claim is true, then we would expect 50% of those people to prefer cherry. So if we do 200 and times 0.5, because 50% of them, that would be 100, um, 50 would prefer grape, and 50 would prefer orange. Okay, so those would be the expected values if the company's claim is true. And now we want to know which of these two samples um, would give us stronger evidence against the claim. So hopefully you picked sample two. I'm going to get rid of this line. It's stressing me out. Um, so this would give you stronger evidence against the claim. And we can think about that by comparing to these expected counts, right? If we look at the counts that are in sample two, the data that are in sample two are further from the expected counts. Further from the expected data. So if it's further from what we would have expected if the company's claim were true, um, then that's going to give us stronger evidence against that claim. Okay, so we're going to kind of build on this reasoning um, to get a little bit more technical with it. Um, so this is a goodness of fit test. A goodness of fit test is a way to analyze one categorical variable. So we've actually seen one categorical variable in the past. We did a one proportion t-test. Um, so what makes this different from a one proportion t-test is that here we have more than two categories. So we can't think of it as just success and failure. Um, we have cherry, grape, and orange. We have three different categories um, that we have to consider. So here's another example. This is some data that I collected actually last year. Obviously, we couldn't um, collect it since we're not together this time. Um, but the question is, where do MSIT 3000 students live? Is the distribution the same as the UGA population? Okay, so I have data here for the UGA population. Um, this is information that, that I found online. Um, and this is going to be my null hypothesis. So my null hypothesis would be that MSIT students are actually the same as the UGA population. Um, they have the same breakdown of housing options. Okay, and then I collected some sample data. So the word we usually use in chi-squared is observed, observed counts, but that just means the data that you actually have in your sample. So when I collected this data last semester, I got 56 people who lived off campus, 15 people who lived in fraternity or sorority housing, seven people who lived on campus or in some other UGA-owned housing. So there were 78 people total, okay? So I'm going to compare my observed counts to what I would expect if the null hypothesis were true, if MSIT really matched the UGA population. So what would we expect if the null hypothesis were true? So just like you did up here, where you took the sample size and you multiplied it by the percentage, that's what we're going to do. So we're going to take our sample size with 78 and multiply it by the percentage, 0.66, and that comes out to be 51.48. So even though they're called expected counts, we really mean what we expect on average. So don't round these. 
Okay, so we would have expected 51.48 to live off campus. Our actual data was a little higher than that. Um, similarly, we can calculate the others. We would have expected 4.29 to live in fraternity or sorority housing. Our sample data was actually a good bit higher than that. And we would have expected 22.23 to live on campus. So our sample data was a good bit lower. And again, the expected counts are going to add up to the same sample size. So still 78 here. So we can see that our observed and expected counts aren't exactly the same, but the question is, could these have occurred just by chance if the distribution for MSIT students were really the same as the UGA population, right? Maybe they just didn't match perfectly um, just by random chance. So the null hypothesis is that these proportions are all really the same as what it is for all of UGA. So we could say MSIT the same as UGA population. That would be our null hypothesis. And then the alternative, it's not that they're all different, it's just that at least one of these proportions is different from the values given. So in other words, that the MSIT distribution is different than the UGA population. All right, so before we just sort of looked at um, comparing the observed and the expected counts, but sometimes it's not always easy to measure how far the observed are from the expected. So that's where the chi-squared statistic comes in. So the purpose is just to compare the observed and the expected counts. Okay, so let's do that. So we're gonna do this one category at a time. So we'll start with off campus. Our actual data, the observed count was 56. Our expected count that we calculated was 51.48. We're going to square that, put the expected count down here, 51.48. This sigma, this uppercase sigma, that's a sum. So we're going to add it up, and we're going to do this for each of the categories. 15 minus 4.29 squared over 4.29. And then the last category, 7 minus 22.23 squared over 22.23. Okay, so again, before I tell you um, how to interpret this number, I want you to kind of think about what it means. So if we add all this up, we get a chi-squared statistic of 37.5686. But what does that mean? How do we actually use a chi-squared statistic? Okay, so the questions below these bullet points are asking what does it mean to say the observed counts are somewhat close to the expected counts? What's that going to do to your chi-square statistic? What's it going to do to the strength of evidence? Um, and then also what does it mean if the observed counts are very different from the expected counts? So one more time, pause the video and then we'll um, look at the answers. All right, so if the observed counts are somewhat close to the expected counts, right, the difference here is going to be small. Um, and so you're going to end up with a small chi-squared statistic. And if what you observed is pretty close to what you would have expected based on the null being true, then that means that your data gives weak evidence against the null, right? Because your actual data was pretty close to what you'd expect it to be, right? That's not going to be very much evidence. Whereas if the observed counts differ greatly from the expected counts, this difference, observed minus expected, is going to be large. And if your data is really different from what, it, what you expected it to be, that's going to be strong evidence against the null hypothesis. So, of course, there's this problem. We're saying close and differ greatly. Those are pretty subjective terms. Um, so in the next video, I'll show you how to use jump to actually calculate p-values um, and quantify how large does your chi-square statistic need to be um, before you're convinced that there's a difference in the distribution.